Welcome to ECE 203. This is a lecture on how we're going to build wireless power transfer systems in order to power and or charge implantable medical devices through a transcutaneous link. So if you're following along in the textbook, I recommend reading the uh, chapters 16 and 17 in the Sarpeshkar text. Chapter 17 is largely dealing with transcutaneous communication systems, which we won't have time to talk about in today's lecture. Instead, we're going to focus on power transfer. Uh, there's also a book uh, that I've uh, co-edited and wrote a chapter in on transcutaneous power transfer, as well as a paper uh, that I wrote that uh, we'll refer throughout this course, uh, throughout this lecture. So the motivation for transcutaneous wireless power transfer is that energy storage can be a big bottleneck in the design of implantable systems. Uh, this is an example of something we don't want to build. Uh, this is a pacemaker uh, that is uh, far too large for the patient and it's sticking out, perhaps due to uh, improper surgical techniques. Uh, but still, you know, we'd rather not have a, you know, a larger than necessary thing inside of our body. So it turns out that there's two primary options uh, to power a implant. One is that we can just fully implant a battery. Uh, and this is what most pacemaker technologies end up choosing uh, in, in, because the power consumption of the pacemaker itself is low enough such that a reasonably sized battery could last, let's say, around 10 years. And that's a reasonable amount of time for an implant to last in, in a patient. After 10 years, there may be much better technology available that maybe the patient will want. Uh, however, unfortunately, a fully implanted battery tends to not, you can't charge it, right? And, and so, and as a result, when that battery inevitably dies, well, we have to do surgery to replace uh, the device, okay? So option number two is using a transcutaneous wireless power transfer link. This is something where we put the battery on the outside of the patient and use this wireless power transfer link to deliver continuous amounts of power to the implant in order for it to operate. So on the right here, we have a picture of a cochlear implant. This is a, otherwise known as a bionic ear. This is something that helps deaf uh, patients here or certain types of deaf patients here anyways. And it turns out that it's very difficult to build a fully implanted cochlear implant because the power needs are much higher than they are for a pacemaker, okay? So a pacemaker is, is kind of microwatts of power whereas a cochlear implant is milliwatts of power. And so that 10 year battery life, uh, if we were to translate that to a cochlear implant, would be more like you know a day or two, um, which is obviously not satisfactory. Now there is a middle ground here. We could put in an, impl uh, uh, an implanted battery and have a wireless recharge feature for that battery. Now there are you know various pros and cons for these uh, kinds of approaches. So the you know benefits of a battery is well we understand how batteries work uh, we have fairly low complex power management. Uh, the user and this is important there's no interaction required the user doesn't have to recharge the battery or anything like this it just works it retains functionality at all times. For a pacing application that's pretty important that's pretty important okay. Um, but, you know, we do require a fairly large battery, and uh, as a result, this is only suitable for applications that have relatively low power consumptions. On the other hand, transcutaneous wireless power transfer, you know, it, the, I, I have here on the slide, it's less understood. That's arguable today. I think wireless power transfer is, is fairly uh, well understood at this point. Uh, but more importantly, from the user's perspective, you must wear your external device in order to access features from your device. So if you remove that external device because uh, of some aesthetic choices or because you want to go take a shower or go swimming or something like this, then you're going to lose functionality to your implant. And that may or may not be a big deal uh, to the users. That's definitely not something you'd want in a pacemaking application. You know, you want your heart to continue beating. Uh, you don't have, want to have to rely on an external wearable. Now, the benefit of providing power externally is that you might be able to design a smaller device because now you don't need to include a very long lasting battery. 
Uh, but in some applications, you just have no choice. A cochlear implant needs about a milliwatt of power. You really need that to come from an external device. So if we were to implant an energy storage element, we have a couple different options. We can do batteries, typically some sort of lithium ion type of battery. They have relatively good or actually very good energy densities. They can store a lot of energy per unit volume. Uh, so for example, let's just say we had a cochlear implant application. The power consumption was one milliwatt. Then this uh, lithium ion battery would last for about 94 hours, assuming a one cubic centimeter volume was available to it. So obviously that's not good enough for a chronic implant. Uh, and so as a result, we would need to wirelessly, wirelessly recharge that battery. Now charging a lithium ion battery typically takes hours and the battery has a limited operational lifetime or, or overall lifetime, I suppose, in terms of a limited number of recharge cycles before it just stops storing a, a lot of energy. On the other hand, we can go to solid state batteries. These tend to be quite a bit smaller as well as smaller energy densities. Uh, as a result, you know, under the same constraints, one cubic centimeter and one milliwatt of power consumption, we're talking about a nine hour operational lifetime. So that's not great. We can recharge these things quite a bit more times than a lithium ion battery and the charging time's a little lower. So maybe there's some use here. Another possibility is ultra capacitors or super capacitors. These are not quite as energy dense as a good lithium ion battery, but you know, at least with research prototypes and so on, they can get pretty, pretty decent energy density. Uh, as a result, we're talking about, you know, roughly a day's worth of operational time, 19 hours. But the really nice thing about ultra capacitors is that you can charge them extremely quickly, minutes instead of hours. And they don't have a large number of recharge cycle limitation. You can charge these things 500,000 times and they're still working just fine. So one possibility for our next generation of say cochlear implants or other implantable devices is perhaps we can add something like an ultra capacitor and we can do rapid once per day charging. Okay, so instead of having the user having to wear this, this wearable for you know, several hours while their lithium ion battery is charging, you just quickly put this on, charge it up for a few minutes, take it off, and then you can go about your day retaining full functionality for your implant. This is one nice possibility that some users might appreciate uh, as an alternative uh, to the conventional batteries or just straight up wireless power transfer. So let's talk about uh, the origins of wireless power transfer before getting into some of the technical details. Um, I tend, I like to ask this question, who, who was the first person who actually demonstrated wireless power transfer? Now the um, popular answer is Nikola Tesla, but actually it was Hertz uh, in the late 1800s uh, had, had shown uh, some mechanism of wireless power transfer. Of course, it was popularized by uh, Nikola Tesla in the early 1900s, uh, though his uh, research was eventually abandoned. Um, now, this is a famous picture of Tesla you know, in his lab. Um, it turns out that this is actually not a, um, a, a factual picture. He wasn't actually sitting there while this uh, sparking was going on. This was um, done uh, through some clever uh, use of photography here, but it's still a pretty neat picture. So in the early 1900s, you know, Tesla was talking about doing all sorts of interesting wireless power transfer things, um, including building these huge towers that were going to um, work with the ionosphere and, and deliver power to everybody, you know, everywhere within a, a large ge geographical radius. Uh, some very interesting ideas, mostly based on uh, resonance and, you know, um, some of the fundamentals that, that he worked on were, were very good, but uh, some of his grander ideas, um, well, let's just say they didn't pan out. But interestingly, there's been a lot of in interest and experiments on wireless power transfer beyond uh, what we would have perhaps even expected a long time ago. So this is an example of uh, a drone in the 1960s that is wirelessly powered. This is an example from Raytheon. Um, this is a very interesting system that they could do this in the 1960s, um, powering you know, the, a full UAV. 
And this was based on, you know, a, a huge amount of directed energy uh, directed to this um, to this uh, drone, if you will, here. Most forms of wireless power transfer, I think, draw their uh, at least uh, commercial origins to the to, to the implant community. In fact, uh, cochlear implants uh, were developed in the 1970s, and um, they needed power, right, to operate. And they couldn't find batteries that are big enough, and they could, couldn't find a good place to fit the batteries in. And so they were searching for other solutions. Uh, in the 1970s, there's a lot of work on glucose biofuel cells, um, which are an interesting uh, technology choice using glucose naturally available in the body as a source of energy. In fact, uh, we've worked on this here at UCSD. And uh, it, it's, it's quite an interesting idea. It does turn out that there are some longevity constraints uh, with those sort of things. Uh, and so as a result, in the 70s, they ended up uh, going to using wireless power transfer. And uh, this forms the basis for basically all of the wireless charging devices that we have available on the market today. So, you know, you buy an electric toothbrush and it charges wirelessly. You buy an Apple Watch, it charges wirelessly. Most cell phones charge wirelessly today as well. Now, it turns out it's based on all of the same mechanisms. Um, in fact, all of these mechanisms were known in the 1970s. They were just popularized um, somewhat recently. Um, there were some different standards uh, for wireless power transfer. Uh, some were operating at different frequencies than others. It turns out that the, the Qi standard kind of basically came to the top, even though, frankly, it's uh, technically not as good as what some of the other uh, standards were proposing to do. Uh, but, you know, due to adoption, um, kind of like how VHS be beat out Betamax, even though Betamax was better, uh, due to adoption in the marketplace, the, the Qi standard ended up uh, standing on its own. So how does wireless power transfer work? Well, it's basically just a result of Ampere's and Faraday's law. You take an alternating current into a wire, which creates a magnetic field. This is your transmitter. And then this changing magnetic field will flux through a coil and that'll generate a voltage. Okay, so wireless power transfer, at least in this case, I'm talking about near field wireless power transfer, which is uh, different than perhaps what uh, uh, that Raytheon uh, thing showed, um, which uh, uh, may not be based on near field wireless power transfer. But for near field wireless power transfer, that's it. Basically what it means is you're building a transformer, a transformer that's loosely coupled. There's some distance between these coils and that's okay. But nevertheless, it's a transformer. That's basically what wireless power transfer is, at least near field. So as a result, we can model this using transformer theory. This is the basic uh, block diagram, if you will, of a typical wireless power transfer link. You have some signal source. It goes into a power amplifier through a matching network uh, to a coil. Okay. This coil has N1 turns with an inductance of L1 separated by a distance D to another coil, um, which we call the secondary side, the, the the first one we described is the primary coil. The secondary side coil has N2 turns with an inductance L2. Uh, the coupling coefficient between the two coils is given by lowercase k. It can vary somewhere between 0 and 1, 1 being perfect coupling and 0 being no coupling. Uh, the mutual inductance is just equal to k times the square root of L1 times L2. And so the secondary coil then uh, attaches to a matching network. It goes through a rectifier and then powers a DC load. So for transcutaneous wireless power transfer links, we typically say that the coupling coefficient is anywhere between, uh, let's say 0 0.03 and 0 0.3, okay? So as a result, we can model these things as a loosely coupled transformer. Now, a few more definitions. RLDC is what we would say as the effective DC resistance that models the load. You could use a current source or you know whatever load model that that, that you like. Uh, if we're charging a capacitor or something like this, it might have a, a model that is a time varying, instantaneously changing resistance. Um, but this is the resistance after the rectifier. The rectifier is by definition a nonlinear circuit that rectifies an incoming sinusoidal signal into a um, square or into a ideally a DC signal. 
Um, and so it's very difficult for us to analyze nonlinear systems. Uh, and so what we typically like to do is we prefer to look at the resistance looking into the rectifier. We'll call this RLAC. And as a very loose model, um, again, very loose, but good enough for our purposes, perhaps, we can say, well, this is approximately RLDC divided by two, um, which we will uh, basically say this is equal to RL in the, in the coming slides. Okay, noting that RL is just um, the, the load seen by the matching network, not necessarily the actual load resistance model. So it turns out uh, if we follow some basic guidelines, a lot of these things can actually be analytically described. If we're operating at reasonably low frequencies, if we're using circular loops, uh, using circular you know, wire, then we can estimate the inductance and the coupling coefficient, if, as long as they're axially, axially located, uh, by the following e equations. Okay, lowercase r1 and 2 are the radius of the loop, and d1 and d2 are the diameters of each um, circular wire. And the coupling coefficient is, is given over here. Uh, it basically depends on the geometry and the separation of the wires. Now, most importantly, we see that the coupling decreases. The coupling decreases with distance d. Okay, so as you pull these coils further and further apart, the coupling coefficient naturally, and this should make sense, decreases. Okay, so it turns out that we as circuit designers don't have a whole lot of say in terms of what happens with coupling coefficient. This depends on the geometry of the coils and their separation. The separation for a transcutaneous wireless power transfer link will have some variability associated with it, along with some minimum separation. You know, we have to have this link go through skin. Again, the reason we want to do this is because we don't want to have wires coming out of the skin that will in, you know, induce infection and so on. So this does need to be a wireless link. And people have, you know, well, some people have thicker skin than others. Let's just put it that way, okay? So we as engineers have to realize that D will change. And as a result, K, our coupling coefficient will change. And we need to be uh, resilient to possible variations in that. One of the most important uh, factors that uh, assert or assess the wireless power transfer efficiency of uh, such a link is the quality factor of the coils. Uh, those of you who have taken RF circuits very much know what quality factor means. Uh, for those of you who haven't, it's uh, basically a, a metric uh, that describes the amount of energy stored in a circuit versus the average power dissipated in said circuit, okay? For an inductor, we can say that the quality factor Q is equal to omega L divided by the series resistance of the coil. Uh, because inductors are made out of wire, wire has resistance unless it's superconducting. Uh, and so as a result, an inductor will have a high a finite quality factor. So the series uh, resistance depends on the length of the wire. Uh, let me write that more specifically down. Length of wire, um, diameter, obviously. Uh, it does depend on frequency uh, due to the skin effect. Uh, metal type. and so on. Okay, so again, Q is going to be a major limiter for us, so we want to pay careful attention to it, make sure we understand what's limiting the Q, so that if possible, we can try and optimize it. So when we're de designing an implantable system, there's two possible goals that we might set ourselves for the, the design of our wireless power transfer system. For continuously worn devices, uh, and by that I mean things like cochlear implants that you need continuous power transfer to your device, you probably want to maximize power transfer efficiency in order to maximize the operational lifetime of the external wearable device. 
If you're instead periodically recharging uh, a battery, an implanted battery, you might want to instead minimize charging time, which is typically minimized by maximizing the amount of power driven to the load, which is your battery, of course, given source and system constraints. So it turns out these two things are not the same. Maximizing power transfer efficiency does not necessarily maximize power transfer to the load. It does, however, turn out that in general, designing coils with high quality factors and a system with a large coupling coefficient will allow you to do better in both of these categories. Okay, And so when we're designing our systems, we really need to keep these two things uh, in mind. What are we trying to optimize for? Very important. So I'd like to dive into the difference between maximum efficiency and maximum power transfer with a very easy to understand, very specific example. Uh, this is a circuit uh, I, I'm sure you've all seen. We have a source. It has some sort of associated resistance with it. So this, I guess, would be the model of our source. This is our black box. And we have control over some load resistor RL. Okay, so here's V out. So we know that the transfer function here, V out over VS, is just a resistive divider. It's equal to RL divided by RL plus RS. Okay. We can also calculate what the output power is, the power uh, dissipated across resistor RL, and that would be VS squared times RL squared over RL plus RS squared, or in other words, V out squared, divided by RL. Okay, so we can simplify that a little bit. That's VS squared RL divided by RS plus RL squared. Okay, so if we want high output power for high P out, then what do we want to do here? Actually, according to the maximum power transfer uh, condition, or the maximum power transfer theorem, we want to set RL to be equal to RS. Okay, that is the maximum power point condition. Okay, but let's go ahead and calculate the efficiency of this circuit. The efficiency is actually just given by the resistive divider itself, RL divided by RL plus RS. So at the maximum power point, our efficiency is 50%. Half of the power is being dissipated in RS and half of it is being dissipated in RL. Okay, so this is um, not really a, a good point here. Um, we would normally like to design systems that have more than 50% efficiency. Um, so this theorem was actually uh, misunderstood originally uh, by people like Joule, for example, uh, that thought that an electric motor, which in this case would be our black box, driven by a battery, or sorry, uh, by, by a battery, could not be more than 50% efficient since when the impedances were matched, you lost half of the power um, as heat, okay, and not being delivered to the motor. And, and again, that is true, okay, uh, in that particular condition. However, for high P out, or sorry, for high efficiency, eta, what do we want to do? Actually, what we want, we get infinite efficiency if RL is infinity. Right, at which point we're delivering no power to the load. Um, but, um, but, but you know, these are two very different conditions, right? For high efficiency, we want RL big. For high output power, we want RL to be equal to RS. Okay, so in general, it's not possible to achieve both maximum power transfer and optimal efficiency at the same time in a system. Okay, so how is it that we can build systems that are more than 50% efficient? Well, it turns out that either we just are okay with not delivering the maximum power, um, or we have control somehow over RS. If we have control over RS, then ideally we just make RS zero, right? Then we get as much power as we need to the load and we get 100% efficiency. Okay, this is what we do in, for example, power amplifier design for RF systems. We strive to make RS equal to zero. 
we don't make RST equal to 50 ohms. In fact, we try to make it equal to zero. Okay, so in other words, what I'm saying here is if you do have control over your black box here, then you can usually get good efficiency and what I'll call enough power transfer to the load by making RS small. And that's really our objective when we're going to go ahead and analyze how to build these wireless power transfer links. So what's going on with these matching networks? Um, so it turns out that we can show that employing capacitive matching uh, designed specifically to resonate out the inductance of the two coils can help enable optimum power transfer conditions. This of course depends on the impedance of the power amplifier and the load and so on. Uh, there are more complicated matching networks that we could potentially consider here and uh, taking the RF courses would give you some more insight in, into what I mean by different sort of matching networks. Uh, but for, for now, we're going to go with a simple uh, capacitive match. Now, in order to discuss the simple capacitive match, I want to go over a very brief example of a series resonance circuit. I recognize that not everyone has taken RF circuits here, so let's make sure that we're all on the same page. So a simple series resonance circuit will look something like this. Okay, we have uh, our S, this is our VS and RS, this is our source. We have an L, a C, some load resistance RL, and V out is right here. Okay, so what we can say here is that V out over VS, the transfer function here is equal to RL divided by RS plus J omega L plus one over J omega C plus RL, okay? So if we operate the circuit where the frequency omega is equal to omega naught, which is equal to one over the square root of L times C, then this expression simplifies greatly. The L and the C impedances cancel out at the resonant frequency and the impedance or the transfer function just becomes the impedance divider, okay? So this is a fully real component. There's no imaginary component here. And we can say that the output power P out, which is equal to just to V out squared divided by RL is equal to, well, that same expression we derived in that earlier slide, Vs squared RL divided by RS plus RL squared. So again, if we are interested in optimizing the power transfer efficiency, then we just need to either make RS zero or RL very big. Um, and that'll give us our, our maximum efficiency. If we want to maximize the power delivered to the load, then we just want to make RL equal to RS. So here is a, a model that we're going to use for circuit analysis. Uh, in this case, I have the source on the left. I have these two capacitors here. I'm going to call this a series series match. And then this uh, inductive coupling region in the middle is a circuit model that describes how these loosely coupled coils uh, interact with one another. Okay, so basically what we have is two coils. They have some coupling coefficient between them. Uh, the coupling coefficient is K. It's given uh, by the mutual inductance divided by the square root of the two, the two inductors. And uh, basically the, the, they're coupled and so the current flowing through one will result in a DC voltage generated in the other and vice versa. Okay, so this is a normal circuit model for a transformer. We're gonna make one more definition, lowercase n, not the subthreshold coefficient in this uh, lecture. It's going to be defined as the ratio uh, between L2 and L1 square rooted. So what I drew on the previous slide is what we call a series series match. Um, and this is going to be uh, something that we're going to use just because it's a little easier analytically to analyze the circuit. Um, but it's not the only possibility for a single capacitor matching network. Note that of course there are other types of matching networks available that, that we're not going to study here. Um, but uh, so if there's series series, then presumably there's parallel series, parallel parallel, and you know uh, the various permutations here. So it turns out that a parallel capacitor on the primary side, so that would be this guy and this guy, are typically used, uh, they're good for um, current source drivers. 
Okay, so if your power amplifier is a current-based power amplifier, then a parallel match is probably what you're going to want just because it's a more easily represented by a Norton equivalent circuit. And likewise, if you have a voltage source driver, a series match on the primary uh, is typically uh, good. Good for voltage sources. Now, in terms of selecting things for the secondary, it turns out that a parallel capacitor is mostly what you see in the biomedical implant literature. And the reason this is good is because we get a Q multiplied voltage here, which makes it easier to turn on the rectification diode, particularly when we have a, a small coupling coefficient. So this is typically good for uh, low power applications. Whereas a series match on the secondary side, we basically get a Q multiplied current, uh, which if we have enough voltage already to turn on our rectification diodes, then this could be advantageous as a way to get more power delivered to the output uh, without having uh, running into very large voltages. So this we would say is generally preferable for high power uh, kind of applications. So I'd like to start doing some circuit analysis on this inductively coupled wireless power transfer system. And we start with the uh, circuit shown on the top here. Uh, this is the good uh, you know, transformer based model, but this is very difficult for us to analyze. It's a feedback circuit. There's uh, dependent voltage sources here that depend on currents and so on. It's a very unintuitive circuit to analyze. Let's go ahead and derive the characteristic equations of the circuit first anyways, uh, which is going to give us something that we can uh, rely on to simplify the circuit as we'll see uh, into the bottom one. So V1 of S is equal to SL1 times I1 of S, this is the current or the voltage drop across L1, plus, well, the voltage across the dependent generator, SM I2 of S, okay? Likewise, V2 of S is equal to SL2 times I2 of S plus SM I1 of S. Okay, this is what we're, we would call the characteristic equations. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest that the circuit on the bottom is mathematically identical to the circuit on the top. The circuit on the bottom has what we call a leakage inductance, L1 times one minus K squared. It has an ideal transformer with a K to N transformation ratio and uh, um, secondary inductance L2 followed by you know, whatever load we've connected to it. So I'm gonna label a few things here. I'm gonna call this voltage here VA and I'm gonna call this current here IA, okay? And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to derive a set of equations for this circuit, and I'll show you that they actually match the, the characteristic equations that we showed above. So we'll say here that V2 is equal to N over K times VA, assuming that this is an ideal transformer with a K to N transformation ratio. Likewise, IA is equal to minus K over N times I1. Okay, so the current going into the primary gets transformed uh, into that secondary current. V2 is also equal to SL2 times I2 minus IA, right? That's just the current flowing across inductor L2, which is equal to SL2 times I2 plus K over N times I1, okay? Which is equal to SL2 I2 plus K over N SL2 I1, okay? Which is equal to SL2 I2 plus M over square root of L1 L2, I'm just substituting in um, K there, times the square root of L1 over um, L2, that's the substitution for one over N, times SL2 I1. And if you simplify this out, this gives you SL2 I2 
plus S M I one. And wouldn't you know, this is the same as up here. Okay, so that's just one of the characteristic equations. Um, we can do the same exercise for the for the other uh, uh, um, side. So we can do uh, similar analysis at the input. to prove to ourselves these circuits are identical. Okay, so I'm not gonna do it, but uh, you can go ahead and do that for yourself and, and convince yourself truly that these two circuits are exactly identical to each other mathematically. So now that we've convinced ourselves that these two um, circuits are the same, what we can do now is something called reflected load analysis. This is something that we can do using transformer theory where we can say, hey, you know what? Everything on this side of the transformer, we can push it off to the first side of the transformer. We divide by uh, the turns ratio, the effective turns ratio of the ideal transformer n over k squared to reflect uh, to the primary. And this is going to make our lives very simple so that we can do some very easy analysis. So before we get to that analysis for the actual circuit we're going to build, I wanna take one aside here, a one side note, uh, related to the series parallel conversion of passive networks. So those of you who uh, you know study RFICs know this very well. Uh, for those of you who don't, it's, it's quite simple. So if you have a reactive element in parallel with a resistor, then at a single frequency, and it's important to remember this only functions at a single frequency, not in general across frequency, which many people forget. At a single frequency, you can convert this, I guess, Norton equivalent circuit, if you will, on the left into a Thevenin equivalent circuit on the right, where we have a series, a combination of a reactive element and a resistor. And the relationship between these two circuits are given by the formula on the bottom. The effective parallel resistor is equal to the series resistor times one plus Q squared, whereas the reactance um, in parallel is equal to the series reactance times one plus Q squared over Q squared. So in other words, if we're going from, par from series to parallel and Q happens to be high for this circuit, then effectively we get Q squared times the parallel resistance that we get from the uh, series resistance and the reactance basically just stays the same. Okay, so now I'd like to analyze the circuit model of our um, series series matched inductively coupled system. Okay, and it looks something like this. Okay, we have our power amplifier represented, uh, let's see, Let's say here, this is our power amplifier, has some series impedance RS. C1 is our series matching capacitor. R1 is the resistance of the primary coil. L1 times one minus K squared is the leakage inductor. This is part of that transformer model. R2 is the resistance of the secondary coil. C2 is its uh, series capacitive match. And RL is the load resistance. So what I'm gonna do is the, is the following. I'm going to take L2 and I'm going to reflect it across into the primary. So it's just going to be multiplied by K over N squared. And then I'm going to take this impedance here, this guy, and I'm going to reflect it in its entirety. Okay, so Z2T is equal to R2 plus one over J omega C2 plus RL. Okay, um, we have to, uh, uh, reflect it over in its entirety because it is a series element, but we're doing a parallel um, a reflected load analysis. So this is the, the way to do it. And the other thing I'm going to do, which seems a little strange, uh, but bear with me, is I'm gonna break this inductance up into two separate inductors. One whose inductance is L1, and the other whose inductance is minus K squared L1. So a negative inductor. But this is just a model, so uh, bear with me for, for the moment. So now that we have all of these um, 
components on the primary side, we're, this is just an RLC circuit, right? We know how to analyze RLC circuits. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take these impedances here and I'm going to combine them into one single impedance ZEQ. Okay. If I do that, I have a now a just normal series RLC resonance circuit. All right. Uh, of course, we don't know what ZEQ is, so we can go ahead and derive it. And I've gone ahead and, and done the math for you down here. And as you can see, it is uh, extremely intuitive, right? I'm kidding. Uh, this is very unintuitive, uh, hard to see exactly what's going on here. Okay, it's a very just jumbled mess of, of variables. So I'm going to make one more simplification. I'm going to assume that we're going to run the circuit at the resonant frequency. I'm going to assume that uh, the primary and the secondary both have the same resonant frequencies. This is actually the advantage of the series-series match where this assumption, as long as you've tuned things correctly, can be correct. Uh, in some instances, depending on the load, the series parallel case, um, this may not be uh, possible and there's a few limitations there. But anyways, let's just assume that we're running at the resonant frequency. So omega naught is equal to the one over the square root of either L1 times C1 or one over the square root of L2 times C2. And so I've just uh, relisted the ZEQ parameter here. But if we're assuming we're operating at the resonant frequency, and just for clarity, I'll write it as C2 here, then we can say here that ZEQ ends up being equal to K squared times L1 divided by C2 times RL plus RS. And what's beautiful about this expression is that it is real. So we can call this REQ. There's no J terms in here at all. All of the J terms or all of the uh, uh, cancel out and we get this very simple expression. Okay, that's real. So if it's real, then we could be operating our circuit at the resonant frequency, therefore C1 and L1 that's remaining in our model will cancel out. And ultimately we're just left with this very simple resistive divider circuit. Very nice, okay? So that's what we're going to do to make our analysis very easy. So this slide just summarizes this. Again, we, we had our starting with our transformer circuit model. We reflected everything to the primary. We, you know, fortuitously combined this negative inductance with these other parallel impedances, called it ZEQ. And then if we ran everything at the, at the resonant frequency, we got a nice simple resistive divider circuit. So now we have all the tools we need to compute the power transfer efficiency of a circuit like this, okay? And in fact, we do it in two steps. First, we have our very simplified circuit model of the primary. We can very easily determine how much power in the primary makes its way to the secondary. Uh, that's just a very simple resistive divider. So we'll call that uh, the uh, efficiency of the primary, A to primary. It's equal to REQ divided by RS plus R1 plus REQ, okay? So that's the efficiency of the primary. The efficiency of the secondary, if you look at the circuit model, you have a voltage source, and then assuming that we're resonant, L2 and C2 will cancel out, we have a resistive divider between R2 and RL, right? So basically the efficiency of the secondary is just RL divided by R2 plus RL, okay? So this is uh, an equation that describes the efficiency of, of the power of the entire power transfer system. We're going to make a few simplifications here. Uh, you might look at this and say, this doesn't look like simplifications, but trust me, it is going to help our life a little bit. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say Q1L is the loaded quality factor of the primary. So it's omega L1, that's the inductance of the primary, over RS plus R1. Okay, so I'm going to include the intrinsic resistance of the coil along with the resistance of the driver or the P or the power amplifier, RS. Q2 is as the definition says, omega L2 divided by R2. And so we can go ahead and rewrite REQ, which is given by K squared L1 over C2 times RL plus R2 as the following expression. K squared L1 remains in the numerator, and we'll put C2 times RL plus 
omega L2 divided by Q2. Okay, so that looks more complicated, um, but it turns out that uh, it will help us a little bit in our analysis. So if we recall that the resonant frequency omega naught is equal to one over the square root of L2 times C2, then we can obviously say that one over omega naught L2 is equal to omega naught C2. So this is something that we can use in our expression here. So now we'll go ahead and expand the efficiency uh, formula that we wrote in the previous slide. We'll put in the value of REQ into it um, using this, this, this new definition and simplify until we get to the expression down here. So again, this doesn't look super intuitive, uh, but at least here we have some definable parameters. We have the quality factor of the primary, of the secondary, we have uh, the L's and C's, and we have um, RL in, the, in these expressions. The reason we like to substitute for the quality factor instead of the resistors is it's just easier to um, compare, uh, do relative comparisons using quality factors as opposed to absolute resistors, uh, resistances when we're looking at this stuff. So if uh, I just wrote the formula down here again, so if we're a circuit designer here, what can we possibly control? Okay, um, can we control the quality factor of the coils? Well, not really, right? So, so the Qs are fixed mostly by geometry and materials. So you're going to design implant an implantable system. It's going to have some fixed geometry given by anatomy and the size of the package that you have and so on. You don't really have any control over Q. Okay, so what do we control? Well, we might have control over the load. Perhaps we can decide how much power we want to draw. And uh, we certainly have uh, control um, over, or not certainly, let me say we possibly have control over C2, okay? But if we want to change C2, uh, we have to say, and consequently, if we change C2, we must also change L2 to maintain resonance. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at this efficiency characteristic. Basically what we're saying here is it's really only RL that you have a, a choice over controlling. So I'm going to take the derivative of the efficiency expression with respect to RL and equate it to zero. Okay, and if so, I should be able to get some, I'll call it efficiency optimum load resistance. Okay, and so I've gone ahead and done the math here. Um, it's equal to the square root of L2 over C2 times the square root of one plus k squared q1 comma l times q2 divided by q2. Okay, so this is the optimal load resistance given, you know, geometric, geometrically defined wireless power transfer setup that will optimize, maximize wireless power transfer efficiency. So what this means is that there's only one value of load impedance that maximizes the efficiency of a wireless power transfer link near field. So we can go ahead and substitute that in into the overall efficiency expression. And when we do so, we get the following expression. Now it turns out this is the exact solution for both a series and a parallel tuned secondary. We didn't derive it for the secondary, but it does give you the exact solution. Uh, and this is actually more accurate than the equation uh, that they have in the Sarpeshkar textbook, uh, which uh, uses the following approximation uh, when k is large. Okay, but, uh, but it's hard to always make that approximation. So what I'd rather do is just use the actual uh, correct formula here. So what does this imply here? This is a really interesting formula. The, the answer says that if you set the load impedance correctly to the optimal value, then the efficiency of the link depends only on the quality factor and the coupling coefficients. 
And in fact, the larger Q and K squared are, the closer we get to 100%. Okay, so this is why when we design wireless power transfer links, we really wanna spend a lot of time maximizing the Q and maximizing the coupling coefficient. Of course, as circuit designers, we don't necessarily have a say in that. That depends on many other things. Um, so as circuit designers, we, we treat this basically as an upper bound. This is the best we could possibly do if we design our circuits perfectly. But again, we have to recognize that, hey, this only happens for a single value of load resistance shown below. If we move away from that load resistance, we're not gonna get the optimum efficiency. So what happens to efficiency if we move away from this optimum load point? Well, it turns out that, well, as predicted, efficiency will drop, okay? So, so let's analyze a, a, an example here. Let's say uh, a coupling coefficient of 0 0.1. So the maximum efficiency point is right here. If we draw a line down here, this means that, and, and this was done for some example with some given uh, coupling coefficient and some given, um, uh, well, in this case, it was 0 0.1 and then some given quality factors and so on. But anyways, in this case, we say that, you know, the optimum impedance is a little bit more than 20 ohms for this particular example. Now, if our load resistor happened and happened to be um, 100 ohms, then we would be on this area of the curve over here and we would get, you know, a little over 55% efficiency instead of getting a little over 70% efficiency at the optimum point in the curve here. So this is a big deal, right? There's a there's not that big of a difference between a 20 ohm load and a 100 ohm, ohm load, and yet the efficiency you're going to get is gonna change dramatically. Not only that, if the distance between your coils changes, and therefore your coupling coefficient changes, then this curve will shift, right? So if your coupling coefficient goes to 0 0.04, then the best efficiency you can do is about 50%. And if you're away from the now much lower optimum impedance, more like 10 ohms, you're gonna do much worse, okay? Um, so just as an example, let's say that your application said that your uh, um, optimum impedance needs to be uh, 300 ohms. Okay, so if we look at this, if we happened to have a coupling coefficient of 0 0.4, you're gonna get an efficiency of about 10%. If your coupling coefficient happened to be something more like uh, 0.25, then you're gonna get something over 80% or over 70%, okay? So huge difference. And the only thing that changed is the, is the distance between the coils. What's shown in the, in the dotted black line here is a uh, um, trend line of where the optimum load impedance is and the corresponding efficiency for a continuously uh, varying array of different values of coupling coefficient k. Okay, so this is a challenge. If you wanna maximize power transfer efficiency, you need to be aware of what your load impedance is and what your coupling coefficient is if you want to truly uh, maximize this, optimize it. So what about the other condition? What about the other thing where we're trying to charge a battery or a supercapacitor as fast as possible? If we model it as a resistor, albeit one that perhaps varies with time uh, as the thing charges, then we can do the same sort of analysis. But how do we do maximum power transfer theory here? Because REQ, as you'll recall, REQ is equal to K squared L1 divided by C2 times RL plus R2, right? So, this depends on RL, but it also depends on R2. Uh, we don't wanna maximize power delivered to R2, that's wasteful, that's not being delivered to the load. We want to maximize power to RL. Okay, so how do we figure this out? Well, uh, I had the insight to say, well, we have um, K squared L1 over C2. This is, you know, reactive stuff here. Um, we don't care too much about that but one over RL times R2, that kind of looks like half of a parallel impedance formula, right? That kind of looks like we did R2 times RL, oops, times RL divided by R2 plus RL, okay? 
But of course we can't just do that. We have to then multiply by one over RL times R2 um, in order to be multiplying by one here. So as it turns out, this actually does work. If you can imagine your two resistors or, or you have two resistors in parallel, K squared L1 over C2 R2, in parallel with a resistor of K squared L1 over C2 RL, okay? So you can model REQ as these two parallel resistors, which we'll just show on the next slide. Oh, or right here. So yeah, the, these two resistors, and now that we have these two resistors, we can go ahead and do a maximum power point condition. We can optimize the power delivered over the resistance that's related to RL, not the resistance that's related to R2. So here's how we would go through that, uh, that step. We're calculating the output power delivered to the load resistor only. Okay, that's P out. And uh, that's just equal to VEQ squared over that resistance. We can go ahead and find what VEQ is. It's just a voltage divider. We can substitute in all the terms, substitute that into our P out expression. And then what we can do is we can do a similar optimization strategy here. We can take the derivative of the output power um, with respect to RL and equate it to zero. And if we do so, we get the following um, two formulas. I'm gonna box two versions of it. I'm gonna box this version of it, and I'm gonna box this version of it. Okay, there's a good reason why I'm gonna box these two, and, and you'll see that on the next slide here. Okay, so, but what this means is that the uh, just as it was for maximum power transfer efficiency, if we want to deliver the maximum amount of power to the load, that only happens for a very specific load resistance. So here's those two boxed formulas uh, shown again here. So the optimal load resistance depends on the coupling coefficient, the quality factor of the coils, and the ratio of the secondary reactances, at least according to the, that second equation here. Um, the other thing to note here is that, according to the formula on the left here, if the coupling coefficient k is very small, then the optimum load impedance is just equal to R2. So does this make sense intuitively? Well, recall that our secondary side looks something like this. We have a dependent voltage source. We have resistor R2 here, and we have RL. So assuming we're resonant, of course. So actually, yeah, that, that does make sense. If the coupling coefficient is low, then the amount of impedance reflected to the primary is extremely low, such that um, it, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do on the primary, you're just going to get whatever power uh, gets delivered to that primary circuit. Uh, through the resistive divider in the primary. The load impedance is basically just zero when reflected over. And so as a result, the maximum power point condition occurs when we do a maximum power point condition on the secondary alone. Now this starts to dissolve as we get to higher coupling coefficients because while this maximum power point condition on the secondary still applies, we have to balance it with the fact that um, we will reflect that impedance over to the primary where we also want to be delivering the maximum amount, amount of power to the reflected impedance on that primary, okay? And so as a result, it's no longer just equal to R2. So as it is with the optimum efficiency curves, we have a similar trade-off for optimum output power curves. At a given coupling coefficient, let's call it you know, 0 0.1, we get a certain amount of output power maximized when the load impedance is a certain value. And if that load impedance becomes different, then we shift to a very different part of this curve. Okay. In this particular case, we're talking about you know, 250, 275 milliwatts at um, you know, a little over 100 ohms of resistance. But if we happen to go up to, oh, I don't know, a kilo ohm, then all of a sudden we're getting less than half the power we were before. 
Okay, and again, the dotted black line here is the theoretical optimum given the quality factors that, that um, uh, we presume in this uh, case study uh, for uh, continuously varying amount uh, coupling coefficients. So we can look at the data that I just plotted for efficiency and for output power slightly differently. Instead of plotting versus load resistance, we can plot versus coupling coefficient. And we can optimize and choose the optimal load impedance and look at the efficiency on the left and the output power on the right. So let's look at the efficiency on the left first. If we have a very strong coupling coefficient, something approaching one, then, and if we optimize for efficiency by selecting the appropriate uh, optimal resistor, then you'll see we'll get close to 100% efficiency. This is excellent, okay? But if we instead optimize for maximum power transfer condition, our efficiency peaks out at 50%. Can't do any better than that, uh, assuming we're trying to maximize the amount of power delivered to the load, even though we have uh, a coupling coefficient of one. On the other side, with P out versus K, as we optimize, uh, as K increases and we're optimizing for maximum power, we you know, peak out at the maximum power point um, and a higher coupling coefficient always gives us better performance, more power delivered to the output. But if at the same time, we instead optimize for the maximum efficiency point, what we'll find is that at the maximum efficiency point, we're actually delivering very little power to the output and the amount of power actually goes down as we um, get higher and higher in coupling coefficient. Now keep in mind, you know, this point here corresponds to this point over here. So at when we're being, when we're extremely efficient, we're not delivering nearly as much power uh, to the load. Okay, so this further emphasizes why given fixed coil quality factors, we simply can't achieve both optimal power transfer efficiency and maximum power transfer to the load at the same time. It's just not possible, theoretically. So the big question that, that, that I have is, well, what the heck do we do if something changes in the system, right? Let's say we put the system on someone who has thicker skin than somebody else, or there's more other things in the environment that DQ the coil or something like this. Well, there's two design options we can do. One is we over-design the system. We meet all specs, even under worst case conditions. This you know, is how a lot of engineering projects go, and I understand the reason for it, uh, but we usually lose a lot by doing this. We're gonna lose efficiency, or we're gonna lose absolute amount of power that we can deliver to the load and so on by exercising such trade-offs. Option two, which is something that I prefer when possible, not always possible, but when possible, is through feedback to dynamically tune the circuit to adjust the optimal points so that we're always, uh, or almost always, uh, optimal. So here's one simple example. We know the optimum resistance for efficiency and for maximum power point, and they're different but both of them depend on the ratio of secondary reactances. Okay, they also depend on the coupling coefficient, which we don't really have control over, and the quality factors, which again, we don't have a whole lot of control over. But let's say that we could control the ratio of the secondary reactances by say, selecting between different inductors. So let's say we happened to be at a, um, at a coupling coefficient of 0.1, and we're charging a supercapacitor and, and that, that capacitor's effective resistance as it's charging changes, right? Well, here we see we can achieve a multi-order of magnitude difference in what the optimal load impedance can be just by changing the, the secondary inductance, of course, and changing the uh, capacitance as well to make up for the fact that um, the inductance change and we stay resonant. So one possible idea, and you know, this is just something that, that I happen to have implemented, there are many other ways that one could do this, is to have a secondary inductance that's tapped off at multiple different positions. Okay, if you tap it off at multiple different positions, you get a resonance circuit uh, that has different amounts of inductance, and uh, we can dynamically select which of these taps we want to run at uh, 
depending on the instantaneous um, coupling coefficient uh, or uh, resistor uh, load resistance that happens to be in play here. So I went ahead and built a circuit that does this. Um, and uh, what I was using it for is charging an ultra capacitor for you know, something like a, a cochlear implant application. And in this case, if we only used tap one, the, this first tap, the smallest inductance on the secondary side of things, then we could charge pretty rapidly if our coil separation was small. Okay, time to charge was say three minutes. But as the coil separation started to increase, eventually we just couldn't capture enough energy to turn on those rectifiers and our time to charge just skyrocketed. Okay, so instead we could go to tap two. Okay, so if our coil distance was a little larger, then we had a little bit more capacity or inductance to work with. Our, our optimum charge time was uh, actually just a little um, about the same as, as in tap one, but we could operate over a longer distance. And likewise, if we were operating over an even longer distance, we could choose tap three. Okay, so tap three, which is the, the full coil, would have been the over-designed scenario, right? Because this, this operates over the widest range. But in that particular case, if we happen to have a small coil separation, it's gonna take way longer to charge than if we had selected tap one, right? So the idea here is, well, we're designers, we can measure things. We could perhaps do dynamic tap selection, okay, where we dynamically make a measurement of the power that we're getting delivered and pick optimally the best tap uh, to, to, to select from. In this case, we can extend the operating range by two and a half times and charge up to 3.7 times faster across that, that, that range. So this concludes our lecture on wireless power transfer. We reviewed um, the basics of it. We talked about um, a few different circuit techniques and so on. There's a lot more that one can study here. There's many other topologies. There's circuit design of power amplifiers and rectifiers and so on. We're not uh, gonna have time to get into that today, uh, but if you are interested, there's a, a great uh, source of literature out there for you to explore.